Hmm? What? Let me get. Make my ears ring. Good morning, everyone. I'm Renee. I'm your service associate for this morning. Please take your seats, relax, and be ready to listen to Karen. Good morning. I'm going to play morning of from the Pierkin suite. Um, after all our rain, I feel like this piece really shows the, the nice idea of sun rising and also bird singing and water flowing.
Wow. Thanks, Karen. <laughs> Welcome to our Sunday morning hybrid worship service of Summit UU Fellowship. We are a liberal religious community bound together by shared principles drawn from world religions, humanist teachings, nature and science, philosophy, and personal practices. We are a religion of love and inclusion. The mission of Summit is to commit ourselves to building a more compassionate, just, and sustainable world. If you're new to Unitarian Universalist or to Summit and would like to know more about us, you are invited to go to our website, summituuf.org, click on the visitors button, and fill out the online connection card. Someone will follow up with you. We do have a few announcements, Sandy. Good morning. Show your school spirit. <laughs> now that you've shown your school spirit, it's time to show your summit spirit. <laughs> and um, can we have the slide, please? To uh, tell you about the generosity campaign, we've been going a couple of weeks and we're uh, at about a third of our goal, which is great. On the other hand, there is a large percentage of people who have not sent in their pledge forms yet. So please do so. We have 13 intrepid visiting stewards ready to roll. And they would rather write thank you notes than call you and say, when are you sending in that form? So please, please do so. Um, maybe we'll send them out again. I think there are some, well, there were some hard copies. Perhaps they're in the office now. Uh, check with the office if you need a, a, a copy of the form, um, and maybe we'll send them out again as well. So uh, go Aztecs and go Summit. Al, where'd you hide? So while he's walking up here, uh, the doors are closed, so if you need to use the restroom, go over into the library. They're having a shelter this weekend and next. So we have some new faces joining us. Okay. Hello. Hello. Good morning. Hi. Yeah, so, yeah, first night of shelter started and uh, went very well. Had a couple of bugs to to work out, but other than that, nothing, nothing major, so well, quite pleased. Um, nice people, the guests are very nice, and uh, so what I really need is, uh, I need, if you can please keep in mind and sign up today, I need an o overnight person or two for, uh, on the Tuesday the 11th, basically, and uh, so, and uh, if you can help, so, week from Tuesday, and then what I also really need is tonight and or Tuesday night, I need someone to set up. I mean, if you don't want to, if you can't stay around to clean up, that'd be fine. They can probably make make arrangements, but just to, to set up and get things going for the for the supper. supper. And uh, so, and uh, if other than that, I th think we're in pretty good shape, more or less. And so uh, thank you for all the people that have signed up and really appreciate that. So give yourself a big, big applause. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We want to acknowledge that our fellowship resides on unceded Kumeyaay land and that for more than 10,000 years, this land has been and continues to be home to the Kumeyaay people. We recognize the violent history of colonization in California and honor the legacy of the continuing presence of the Kumeyaay Nation. Guess who's speaking today? <laughs> Dr. Mark Wheeler is here. He's going to be our speaker when it's time. Right now, we're going to read the chalice lighting together, please. Thanks, Alix. You may 
possess only a small light, but uncover it, let it shine, use it in order to bring more light and understanding to the hearts and minds of men and women. Give them not hell, but hope and courage. So if you're able and willing, please stand so we can do our hymn and our Good morning, family. This is a quote from Angela Davis. My idea of philosophy is that if it is not relevant to human problems, if it does not tell us how we can go about eradicating some of the misery in this world, then it is not worth the name philosophy. I think Socrates made a very profound statement when he asserted that the raison d'etre of philosophy is to teach us proper living. In this day and age, proper living means liberation from the urgent problems of poverty, economic necessity, and indoctrination, mental oppression. Musical interlude? Oh, it's time for all of them. I'm coming. Oh, it's now my mic's on. Oh, <laughs> I'm yeah. a speeding ticket. We're all going to give you a ticket. <laughs> there we go. You want to cut back on the mic a little bit? It's a little hot. Cut on volume. There we go. Is that better? Okay. All right, let me take my mask off. Tomorrow is my surgery. So, <laughs> so I'm being extra careful. I'm having my, for those who don't know, I'm having hip replacement surgery tomorrow. And my name is uh, Mary Carter Vale. I'm the Director of Religious Exploration here at Summit. And it's nice to see some new faces visiting today too. Welcome. So we have a, every month we have a theme, right? And our, our theme for the month of April is resistance. Resistance. So resistance, let me make sure my eggs don't fall can be like a for two forces pushing, pushing against each other, right? Like, like when you snap a rubber band, pull a rubber band out, it's really taut and then it snaps back, like there's resistance going on there. Or when you're trying to push a rock up the hill, the rock's resisting you. So you're pushing it up the hill, right? So uh, resistance is also something that we do. It's an action, right? Um, I know many of you have participated in uh, both acts of resistance where you go and march, and also acts of resistance that are more quiet, where you might be writing letters or making phone calls or um, doing things to support various communities that are currently being uh, marginalized and actually attacked legislatively in this country. Last week I did talk about the trans community and how those folks are being singled out right now. So today I was gonna share an art form that comes from my heritage. Um, 
on two sides of my family, I have immigrants from Eastern Europe. And when I researched the names, Ukrainian and Polish heritage is where those names come from. I don't know the details of who came from where, because when they immigrated to this country, they cut off all of that. There was a shame involved in being an immigrant at the time when my families immigrated over here. And so when I remember when I asked my great grandmother, we don't talk about that, was the reply, because there was shame there, which is kind of sad. Um, so, but I brought some of my Ukrainian sanki eggs that I made, which I've showed these before. There's quite a, we're going to be making some of these simplified form. These take days. We're going to do some simplified ones in RE today. And you're welcome to come look at these up close. And the reason I wanted to share these with you today in the theme of resistance is these are made with wax resistance. So wax on the egg then resists the dye. So you put wax on the egg where you want the, the white of the egg to show through to resist the dye. And then as you put it in a, in a next color, like say you went to yellow, you would then put wax on the egg where you wanted the yellow to stay and go on and on till you get to the darkest color. Um, this one is black is the darkest color, which is very traditional. And these eggs, when you hear about them, you hear a lot about the Christian tradition behind them. But they predate Christianity. They go way back to the indigenous communi communities in the Carpathian Mountains. They believed that in that mountain was a, 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 a serpent. There's a lot of serpents associated with evil. I have issue with that, but at any rate. <laughs> so they believed there was a serpent or a monster that was held by chains. And as long as these beautiful eggs were made, that this, this monster would not come out and harm the people. So making these eggs was very important. And in the springtime, this monster would take a survey. Who's making eggs? Are those eggs being made? And if enough were being made, the monster remained hidden. But if not enough were being made, then the chains were loosened and the monster got loose. <coughs> So I think now of the Ukrainian people and the, and the horrors that they've been experiencing over there and the horrors that many people are experiencing in different countries where they're being assaulted and attacked um, just for no reason than their identity, you know? And it's, e it's even happening here. And so making these eggs is an act of resistance. And in the, in the culture, in this culture, the Ukrainian culture and the culture of the Carpathian people, the original culture, these would be buried and hidden in places to protect the community. So when homes are rebuilt, when we get to that point in that area where homes are being rebuilt, the tradition will be for these beautiful eggs to be buried under the home as protection. So um, when, the, when the invasion first started a year ago, um, the war first started in Ukraine a year ago. Word was put out to people who make these eggs, who do this art form to please make them all over the world as an act of peace, an act of resistance uh, for those to support the people there and the people everywhere who are embattled. So. so resistance is a force and an action, right? And we, we feel that deeply, don't we? So I'm sitting here with my bunny ears on because after the service, because I won't be here next week, because I'll be recovering from my surgery, we're going to have a spring egg hunt. I have lots of eggs filled with candy. I have 200 eggs filled with candy, actually more than 200. <laughs> and uh, m way more than I think all these kiddos can uh, consume. So if there's, if, if there's any adults who would like a candy egg or two, please let me know. <laughs> um, and uh, I will be gone until May 2nd. So... I'm going to be gone. For, I have all kinds of things lined up, so there will be things happening. RE will still be happening. We have three families who are going to take on the Sundays that I, when we have sessions. Um, I help plan the Easter service for next week, and we have several families helping with that. So there's going to be lots of fun things going on, even though Mary won't be here. You, you, all, you all got this. You all got this. You all got this. So... Oh, yes, yes. Let me see. My, my mantra is of the DRE is, I'm so excited. I'm so excited. Do it with me. All right. I'm so excited. It's going to be great. And I have faith. And I have faith in all of you. You're going to hold this together. I will be back on May, on May 2nd. And it's going to be great. So I will be letting Eleanor know how my surgery goes. 
and she can spread the word. So, yeah, it's going to be, it's, it's, thank you. It's going to be great. So let's do our, our UU affirmation. And then I'm going to head out that door as we're going to be doing eggs outside there. You're welcome to come see after the service. So ready? We are Unitarian Universalists, a people of open minds, loving hearts, and healthy hands. Now if I can get my seat to turn. Let's see if I can do this. You're pretty good at it. Yeah. There we go. All right, let's, you guys want to help me with the door? This is a reading from the I Ching, one of the ancient Chinese philosophical texts. Where no claims are put forward, no resistance arises. All worthy goals meet resistance of some kind. So if you could stand as you're willing and able, we'll sing hymn 116, a traditional African-American folk song, I'm on my way. Uh, can we get that up there? Good. It is. All right. to listen to Dr. Mark Wheeler on resistance today. Thanks, Renee. Before I start, I'd like, if we could, to take a moment of silence to recognize the people who were killed this week in Nashville, another mass shooting, especially the children. Just take a moment of silence for all those who've suffered violence.
Thank you. Good news, uh, SDSU for the first time made the finals in the NCAA basketball championships. Yay. And it's important to resist grief and, and depression with some good news, yes. <laughs> right? So uh, those, those young men uh, who, who are our boys, right? Sandy and I are both professors at SDSU. Uh, they work so hard they're, and they're good people. Um, how exciting for them and their families. Uh, and we were in an Albertsons uh, buying food and we talked about this with the people we bumped into and it just is such an easy way to find community. You know, such a safe topic, such an easy way to break the ice with people you don't know. So a, a source of joy there. A few weeks ago, um, I was asked by a member of Summit <laughs> to talk about resistance. I thought, oh, a request to serve Summit, made by a fellow and beloved Summitarian. I love Summit, and that's, that's true. Uh, hard to resist. But in my mind, I also resisted. Uh, why me? Uh, I, I feared putting myself on stage and performing. It's never easy. Never easy to do. Always resist it. And I have a lot going on in my life right now. Uh, big changes, big challenges. I'm going to retire uh, from SDSU this summer. I'm going to start seminary in the fall. Uh, you know, am I going to have the time to do this? Am I going to have the energy to do this? Am I going to be able to do it well? And why resistance? Why that topic? Why can't I talk about puppies? <laughs> or like poetry? Or the death of God? Or, you know, resistance. Oof. All this is going through my mind as I hear this request. What I said out loud was, sure! <laughs> why not? Uh, I didn't ask the questions, uh, why me, why resistance, but they were answered immediately anyway. The first response, uh, why me, uh, we are so glad you are back and we would love to hear from you. Hard to resist that. Um, you know, I'm always willing to make sacrifices and to struggle for the people I love and we were away for a couple of years and it's so good to be back. Hi puppy. Yeah. Yeah. Slide two. The answer to the second question, why resistance, followed forthwith. Resistance uh, is the UUA monthly theme for April, part of the Soul Matters theme-based ministry series used by many UUA congregations. The theme in March was vulnerability, which was duly resisted by my friends Amy and Pierre. The theme in May will be creativity. That should be interesting. Uh, and the theme for this month is Resistance. Here I really had to resist my desire to go rogue. Uh, the urge to pick another topic was strong. Uh, my mother tells me I was a born contrarian. Of course, I disagree. Uh, I, I think I became a contrarian, but, but however I acquired the disposition, I always have to fight against my desire to adopt a contrary point of view. So I looked into how the UUA monthly themes are conceived by this UUA group named Soul Matters and on their website they say, what paths must, must we lean into and relearn as we travel together into our complex, challenging and hoped for future? Each theme will lift up a particular spiritual path crucial to helping us birth a new normal worthy of all our hopes. And then there's the list of this year's 12 spiritual paths. Slide three. In preparing my talk, therefore, I explored the idea that resistance is a spiritual path, a crucial path for birthing our hoped for future, a challenging path. And more specifically, I decided to consider the spiritual path of resistance in light of the fact that the UUA is considering modifying the seven UUA principles so that all of them are grounded in love, which will become a new and eighth principle. And so the UUA community nationally, internationally is worrying over this right now. Hence my topic for today, love requires the path of nonviolent resistance. The Tao, at least apparently, 
requires the path of inaction, are these two spiritual paths inconsistent? So as some of you know, I'm a trained philosopher. I've, I've been teaching Western philosophy at SDSU since 1995, and I've been in the business since I was far too young. Uh, so uh, as a philosopher, let me lay out some basic assumptions, and then I will consider two arguments that seem to generate a puzzle. I'm going to take it for granted that we are traveling into the future together, a better future, one we would hope to create facing challenges along the way. All of us, you and me, the Summit community, the UUA community, the human family, all creatures great and small, the scintillas of fleeting love, and the epic journeys of planets and stars and galaxies. We're all moving into the future together. The question is, how to get to a better future. I'm going to assume all that. We can talk about all of that if we want in the circle discussion. Those metaphysical questions are, I think, very interesting. And I'm going to define with breathtaking swiftness, <laughs> without any discussion, at least during the talk, the nature of love. An adequate discussion of love would require a year-long series of talks, and I have less than 20 minutes. <laughs> For the curious, however, I'm going to offer a definition of love derived from Aquinas' account to whet your appetite, slide four. We're not going to read that. It's a mouthful and a mind fill, but it can be distilled, slide five. Yes. Love is loving the beloved for the good of the beloved, for the sake of the beloved. Yielding joy. Obviously a circular definition, defining love in terms of love. Philosophers will worry over that. We're not going to worry about that. It's easy to digest. And something like this concept of love is lurking in the background of the talk. Philosophers love definitions. Now let me present a philosophical argument drawn from an important line of thinking in the Western philosophical tradition and the Christian religious tradition, an argument that will help set the stage for what I wish to say about resistance. And first, for giggles, let me present the long version of the argument. Slide six. And that'll be on the quiz. <laughs> yeah, right. But a shorter version will do the trick. Next slide. <laughs> yeah, I can send you this, and then there will be a quiz. Uh, yeah, yeah. Love requires that each of us love all others with all our powers. Two, we can love all others with all our powers only if we do whatever is necessary to help all others live well. Three, helping all others live well essentially involves both protecting all others from harm, violence, and helping all others overcome obstacles to living well, injustices. Therefore, for love requires that each of us practice the spiritual path of nonviolent resistance. And now let me offer another argument drawn from the Taoist tradition, which is both a philosophical and religious tradition, which leads to the conclusion at least apparently, which is apparently in conflict with this, that we must always practice the path of nonviolent resistance. Again, for the sake of revealing the complexity of the issue, the longer version first. Read it and weep, Jenny. <laughs> right, but a shorter version again is all we need, is all we need. The Tao requires that each of us do nothing at all to take a stand against what harms any others, violence, and also to struggle to overcome the obstacles to their living well, injustices, is to do something. Therefore, the Tao requires that each of us not practice the spiritual path of nonviolent resistance. Love requires that each of us resist. The Tao requires that none of us resist what to make of this apparent conflict between two of the world's most important and long-standing wisdom traditions. 
slide 10. Malcolm X, one of my heroes, great philosopher, teaches us a hard lesson about resistance. A man who stands for nothing will fall for anything. It's a hard lesson because it is hard to take a stand for what you believe. It's a hard lesson because it is hard to stand up for yourself. It's hard to resist. To make this topic more concrete and personal, since it could quickly become quite abstract and philosophical, and perhaps, um, perhaps already it has become a bit abstract and philosophical, let me say something about myself and allow me, please, to confess some of my own struggles, each of which has helped me to learn the importance of nonviolent resistance. Remember, Angela, philosophy is a way of living well. I stand here today because I have learned how to resist, and it has been hard to learn how to resist. I've learned how to withstand the temptation to drink and use. I'm a recovering alcoholic and recovering addict. I've been clean and sober for over 22 years. That was hard. It's a big, a big struggle. I've learned how to prevent sexual harassment and sexual assault and sexual violence and other forms of violence. I've never been a violent person. I am a survivor of sexual harassment sexual assault and rape, all of which happened when I was an adult. I've studied the Chinese martial arts for decades now, learning how to use nonviolent methods to resist all forms of violence. The injustices and violence of misogyny and patriarchy, racial violence, anti-Semitism, rage, greed, and lust are everywhere present. I've had the good fortune to travel around the world, and it's everywhere. I've joined the struggle for social justice in my communities with my wife and my friends, with Summit. Lex and I have been together for 33 years. We're going to celebrate our 30th wedding anniversary in June, God willing. We are very much in love. I have close family, and I've had the good fortune to love my family for over 50 years. I'm going to be 57 this September. I have friends I've known and loved for decades. I've learned how to help them thrive. I've learned how to resist the forces that split love apart. Not easy to stay married. Alex is wonderful. Our marriage is wonderful, but it's work. I've been with SDSU for almost 30 years, my Kung Fu community for almost 30 years, Summit for 20 years. I've struggled to find, and I think I've made some headway in finding communities within which I can resist violence, where I can struggle to reduce injustice. Resistance, Mary did a nice job. From the old French, resister, from the Latin, resistere, from the prefix, re, which expresses opposition, and the verb sistere, which is a wonderful verb. It expresses a reduplication of the verb stare, which means to stand. So resistance is to stand, standing in opposition. And as it's ordinarily used, it means either one, to withstand the action or effect of something, as in to resist the tick-borne infection that threatens to kill me. You may remember I came back from Africa once with a terrible disease that the CDC came into the hospital room. They're all dressed in these wonderfully plastic clothing. And I was dying from this thing. And my body and the drugs helped me to resist that. Or to resist with kindness the hateful verbal abuse of an angry colleague. To withstand that. Or two, to prevent something by action or argument, as in to resist by means of physical force the violent attack of a sexual predator or to resist by means of rational argument the rhetoric of white supremacists. Or three, to struggle against something or someone, as in to resist the temptation, the desire to take a drink or to use a drug, or to resist nonviolently the verbal and physical violence of a hateful mob harassing young women 
outside of a Planned Parenthood facility. Felix and I have had to do that. We've wanted to do that. It would be a better world if we didn't have to do that. How shall we approach our future? What method or methods, which paths shall we employ as we travel together creating our common futures? Well, first of all, what is a spiritual path? Because this could get all woolly, ooh, you, 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 right? A path for the spirit? And what is a spirit? Well, I'm going to draw on Hegel and the tradition that emerges out of Hegel, but it's a longstanding tradition in the West. Spirituality is all about consciousness. A spiritual path is a way of being conscious. It's a way of interpreting. It's a way of thinking. But most importantly, it's a way of willing. It's a way of choosing. A method, a way. A spiritual path of resistance would be a method of consciously withstanding or preventing or struggling against someone or something intending to do you harm. You told me not to look at you while I was talking, Tom. <laughs> but you're, you're bringing some strange voice into this world. It's a spirit from beyond! <laughs> the spiritual path of resistance is a method we deliberately choose in order to resist violence and injustice. We take a stand and choose to oppose violence. We take a stand and we choose to work toward justice. Of course, many choose the spiritual path of violent resistance. The path, this violent path, seems well expressed by Dylan Thomas. Slide 11. He's so handsome. Do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. The wise men at their end know dark is right. Because their words had forked no lightning, they do not go gentle into that good night. Good men, the last wave by, crying how bright their frail deeds might have danced in a green bay, rage, rage against the dying of the light. Wild men who caught and sang the sun in flight and learn too late, they grieved it on its way, do not go gentle into that good night. Grave men near death who see with blinding sight, blind eyes could blaze like meteors and be gay. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. And you, my father, there on the sad height, curse, bless me now with your fierce tears, I pray. Do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Next slide. One hell of a spiritual path indeed. Burn, rave, fierce tears, do not go gentle, rage. A spiritual path of anger and rage. In many ways, a rebellion without a cause, an Achilles warring with all of the consequences of his wrath. Rage, fear, self-destruction, violence. But love requires nonviolence. Love is opposed to all forms of violence. Thus, of course, turn the other cheek. Slide 13. A spiritual path of resistance regulated by love must be nonviolent. A poem by Maya Angelou suggests the spiritual path of resistance required by love. This is Caged Bird. A free bird leaps on the back of the wind and floats downstream till the current ends and dips his wing in the orange sun rays and dares to claim the sky. But a bird that stalks down his narrow cage can seldom see through his bars of rage. His wings are clipped and his feet are tied, so he opens his throat to sing. The caged bird sings with a fearful trill of things unknown but longed for still. And his tune is heard on the distant hill, for the caged bird sings of freedom. The free bird thinks of another breeze, and the trade winds soft through the sighing trees, and the fat worms waiting on a dawn bright lawn, and he names the sky his own. But a caged bird stands on the grave of dreams, 
His shadow shouts on a nightmare scream. His wings are clipped and his feet are tied, so he opens his throat to sing. The caged bird sings with a fearful trill of things unknown but longed for still. And his tune is heard on the distant hill, for the caged bird sings of freedom. We find ourselves in bondage, caged, oppressed, the victims of violence, the victims of injustice. We find ourselves longing for the freedom to pursue our dreams, the freedom to escape our nightmares, to dare to call the sky our own, longing for the freedom to pursue what we hope for, what we love. We sing songs of resistance, and we resist what harms us. We sing for help as we strive to live well. Next slide. Recall what Angela Davis taught us about philosophy. Some of you may have had Angela Davis with you at UCSD when she was there. My idea of philosophy is that if it is not relevant to human problems, if it does not tell us how we can go about eradicating some of the misery in this world, then it is not worth the name of philosophy. Philosophy, a spiritual path aimed at truth and justice, a path that promises to help us fight against falsehood and lies, a path that promises to help us to fight against injustice, a path that demands we question authority and resist dominant powers. Slide 15, next. The Western philosophical tradition and the Christian tradition that brings the claims of love to us can be contrasted with the Eastern Chinese philosophical tradition of Taoism. The I Ching, one of the fundamental texts, teaches us again that where no claims are put forward, no resistance arises. All worthy goals meet resistance of some kind. Love commands us to stake claims, to make claims. And when we do that, we encounter resistance. So does Taoism. Let me say a little bit about that. Taoism is a philosophical religious tradition, teaching us a spiritual path of inaction or non-action. For example, we learn, the master sees things as they are without trying to control them. She lets them go their own way and resides at the center of the circle. She lets things happen. She steps out of the way and lets the Tao speak for itself. This might seem to require acquiescence or quiescence, a kind of fatalism. And in one sense of action, this is true for Taoism. If by action we mean choosing to act on the basis of what the self desires to do, then Taoism indeed urges us to cease all action of that sort. We should never act on the basis of the self and its desires. A different part of the Tao Te Ching. The reason we have a lot of trouble is that we have selves. If we had no selves, what troubles would we have? But is there some other way to act according to Taoism? Can we avoid acting on the basis of our desires ourselves? And the answer to that question is yes. The Tao teaches us to pay attention to what is happening. In so doing, we step away from ourselves and listen to what the broader Tao tells us to do. And then we should shape events as they happen on the basis of what the Tao tells us to do. Quote, Therefore, those who embody nobility to act for the sake of the world, not on the basis of selfish desires, seem to be able to draw the world to them. Those who embody love to act for the sake of the world seem to be worthy of the trust of the world. The Tao requires that we act on the basis of the Tao which is to embody love and act on the basis of love for the world. There's a deep question here about the meaning of the Tao and its relationship to the Western conception of love. I'll set that aside. Embodying love and acting on the basis of love requires discerning. As concrete and contingent events happen, what to do next in order to satisfy the requirements of love and to act out of love for the world. And this gives rise to resistance, 
Resistance that arises when we undertake to act in perfect alignment with the complex flow of the Tao. There's a confluence of all of us in this room here today. It's a simple example, but it's pregnant with meaning. Every one of us comes here today with our choices, with our flow through this world. And each of us is called to pay attention to each other and to love each other. And there are going to be conflicts. There are going to be differences of direction. And the confluence, the intersection, is where the choice has to happen for love. And it neither gives rise to violence nor ever calls for violence. There are many, many passages in the Taoist literature which speak to the vice of all violence. At each moment of our lives, it is, ethically, it is ethically necessary to follow the spiritual path of nonviolent resistance. This is what love requires of us. This is what the Tao requires of us. And this is what I hope you'll think about having heard me talk today. And now I'd like to engage in a little act of resistance. It's not scripted, but we're going to sing a song. Pierre, I know you're out there. Hi, hi Debbie. Hi, Pierre. Hi, Wendell. Hi, everybody. I, I love you. It's great to see you up there. Um, Sandy and Laurel and my wife, Alix, and I are going to sing a song. You all know the chorus, um, U2's song, Pride, in the Name of Love. So please sing with us on the chorus. We hot? We good? Yeah. Okay. One they come in the name of love. One they come and go. One they come they to justify. One they to overthrow. In the name of love, what more in the name of love? In the name of love, what more in the name of love? When they come call upon why fence, when they they resist, when they washed on an empty beach. One they betrayed with a kiss in the name of love. What more in the name of love? In the name of love. What more in the name of love? Early morning, April 4, shot rings out in a Memphis sky. Free at last, they took your life, they could not take your pride. In the name of love, what more in the name of love? In the name of love. What more in the name of love, in the name of love, what more in the name of love, in the name of love, what more in the name of love.
We are a fellowship supported entirely by the voluntary generosity of our members and friends, and we greatly appreciate our faithful pledges, pledgers who continue to keep up their monthly contributions. It is now easier than ever to contribute to our virtual plate today. The link can be found in the chat box and will take you directly to the donation location. And now we will greatly accept your generous donations during the musical interlude. Hello, I'm playing today a piece called Satyagraha, which is Sanskrit for uh, meaning satya means truth, agraha insistence, which as a fuller meaning is the force that is generated through adherence to truth. And it was used uh, by Mahatma Gandhi and his nonviolent um, resistance movement. By Philip Glass, arranged uh, by, for a piano, because it's originally from an opera.
As we close our service by extinguishing our chalice light, you are invited to stay afterwards for some time of community gathering for joys, concerns, and any questions for the speaker, followed by refreshments in the salon. We invite you to come back next week when Dr. When Reverend Tanya will be here talking about more resistance. Okay. <laughs> please enjoy, please join me in reciting the closing words followed by the circle song. Did you have another hymn? Does everybody want to sing this little light of mine? Yeah, sure. Sure. <laughs> Why don't we do that? Yeah. All right. Please stand if you're willing and able. Thank you. Belt it out. That's all right. Hymn number 118. Closing words are, the most common way people give up their power is by thinking they don't have any. Mm -hmm. Alice Walker. Mm -hmm. okay. So let's gather and have our circle, sing our song. If you have any questions for Mark, please raise your hand. Test, test. Heard Mark go. Looking for questions from Mark. Yes, it's over there already. So, okay, I don't know Heather. Questions? 
Uh, first of all, thank you for saying yes. <laughs> and we're so glad to have the two of you back. Yeah, and I just wanted to say that in order to you know, be a better person. You brought out an issue that I've really struggled with. You did it much more eloquently, but the idea of, you know, when to push and when to let go. And um, I think what I took away from your talk was if it's about yourself, like you're pushing for something that you want in order to help the other person, it should be what the world needs, like you should step back from that. But um, I'm glad you touched on that conflict because it, it's something I struggle with. I'm sure you're familiar with the serenity prayer, mm -hmm. like the wisdom to know the difference, you know, that's the big thing. So, and I think you touched on that a bit, so thank you. I don't know if I really have a question. <laughs> Comment. I can say. If you can speak from there, the oh. camera can, okay. unless you want. No resistance. <laughs> Interestingly, in, in Tai Chi push hands, which is the combative way in which we practice Tai Chi, um, it's all about the balance between when to push and when to pull to let your opponent fall, right? Because you're not committing violence, you're just letting your opponent flow into their own demise. <laughs> <laughs> Not necessarily in an unloving way, right? They say, don't let them bang their head on the floor. Um, but one of the remarkable complexities of the Taoist account of action is you have to divorce yourself from yourself, but you also have to love yourself as part of the flow. So there's, it's not a self-abnegation. It's not as if you're, you're ignoring your genuine need for love yourself. It's that your reason for acting is love or the Tao as opposed to the selfish desire you might have to have another scoop of ice cream or something like that, right? Yeah, it's a very interesting tension in the, in the system. First of all, I wanna thank you for this wonderful talk and approaching this, you know, this subject. And I have a couple of questions. One of them is, uh, what do you have to say about the, you know, and when we're bringing in the idea of love as, well, you talked about it today, both Eastern and Western, metaphysical and more religious, talk about love as a source and a force. And, you know, today you dealt a lot with, you touched on that, but you dealt mostly with actions. How does it show up? That's the force part for me, but source. You know, because I'll often ask people if they believe in a divine, they believe something higher, and they, oh, no, no, no. I said, do you believe love? You know, that love is inclusive, you know, and, and it includes action and non-action. And the other thing that came immediately to mind, being a lover of poetry as yourself, uh, I heard it felt Rumi's words, yeah. say yes by saying no. <laughs> you know, the, the, the different complexities. And one last thing, just anything you might say about, um, you know, great, people like Greg Braden talk about the, that we are in such a state of evolution of consciousness, and one of the ways that it's showing up is to get our minds and our hearts together. And he talks so beautifully about, he and the humanities team, about what that looks like. You know, what does it mean to live from the heart? How do we be a living meditation? So any thoughts on that? Thank you. <laughs> the easy questions, Margo, thanks. <laughs> hey, 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 Rin, is there any way you can put up the very last slide of the presentation? Not the one from the UUA, but the one from Aquinas. Um, so there were at least three questions in there. The first question had to do with love and the nature of love, love as, love as sort of generative source, and um, I'm sorry, was it before this or after this? All the way to the end. That one. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, the Western philosophical tradition, and especially the Christian philosophical tradition argues that love is generative, creative. The Johannine tradition in particular, according to which God is love, 
uh, articulates this probably most forcefully, right, consistently. Um, and there are Western philosophers who aim to articulate what it would mean to say that God is love, what it would mean to say that the cosmos is fundamentally a loving agency, right? Someone like Alfred North Whitehead um, or Henri Bergson, or some of the other process philosophers are working on this. And so what love is, is not easy to specify in a few words. The philosophical tradition develops a very complex and remarkably helpful concept of it, but it involves creativity and generativity. There's the power to love. There are a lot of potential ways to actualize love. But then there's the activity, the creative activity of loving in the moment. And there's some really interesting questions about the philosophy of time here and how the past and the present and the future inform the opportunity for love. And th there are lots of things to say there. Um, but I think the most important point that I would want to draw between the two traditions I'm, I'm mentioning here today is with Schopenhauer, willing, choosing is fundamental to the cosmos. And the physical, the physical, is a manifestation of the consequences of willing, choosing, right? And that willing and choosing uh, at its core is an expression of love. It can go astray, right? We can, because we're free, and, and the argument from a lot of these thinkers is that all of us are free. God is free, you are free, the universe is free, the galaxy is free. And that creates opportunity for real conflict, especially when you make bad decisions. And that creates harm for yourself and for others around you, um, like choosing to go to uh, school and shoot people. You know, didn't have to do that. Mm. Uh, the other two questions, I, I'll, 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 I'll be happy to come back, but it, maybe that's enough there. Um, poetry as an expression of love, yeah. 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 It's great to see you, by the way. I haven't seen you in a long time. Mark, yeah. You did a wonderful job. Oh, thanks. Thank you for letting this little one oh, sit. Yeah. Any time. My brother and I are hiking to see the flowers, and I didn't want to leave them in the car. That's oh, cool. yeah. He's here, but... Yeah. Plato know. said that the dog contains all wisdom. Yes, he does. Dog is heart. God spelled in reverse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For those of us who are dyslexics, that's just the way God is spelled. But anyway, I was noticing that the definitions that you had for love both were very different from the ones I had for love. Actually, the final definition here um, doesn't. Um, the, 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 the version that I gave you for the sake of ease does, and, and that's problematic. But if you take a look at, you can go to that next, that next slide there. You'll see. Aquinas is very careful about this. Uh, and he's drawing from Augustine and Aristotle and Plato before him to craft a conception of love which allows us to recognize the dynamic relationality of love and the way in which selves, as traditionally conceived as atomistic and individual beings, dissolve in the fundamental activity of love. It, it kind of looks like this. <laughs> <laughs> Next. <laughs> I'm sorry, the, very, the last one, the, the one that, 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 this one. Yeah, so notice. Love is an adaptation of the will of the lover. Now, there, the lover is just an agent. You could just screen that off. The will of the lover to the beloved, such that the beloved and the good of the beloved become the object of the lover's will, which adaptation, etc. And we don't actually use the term love in the definition. And again, you can substitute, this is just a simplifier, you can substitute from for lover and beloved terms that don't even suggest love. Right? So agent, patient is one of the ways in which it gets done. Yeah, so it's in its full expression a very carefully non-circular definition. And what I, what, what I enjoy most about Aquinas's 
version of it is he emphasizes the one of the outcomes of love, uh, one of the inevitable outcomes of, of love is joy. And the, the, the vision of the universe is a joyful expression of creative love with fraught, with fraught with difficulty, right? Fraught with difficulty and, and struggle, but, but full of joy. Hi, Mark. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. I, I guess I personalized a great deal of what you were talking about, not so much in, a, in the context of the world, but within my life and my experience of resistance, letting go, and acceptance in the, uh, within taking care of Jeff. Mm. And so, um, you know, you, and all these things happen as, as, as they're part of a normal life, and then an end of a life, which we are all bound for. And so you, you get a diagnosis and you resist that because there must be a mistake. And then you begin to see that, no, I think they're probably right. And you begin to accept that this is what's happening. And then at some point, you realize that it's time to let go. And there's really nothing more to do. And you have to hold all of that in love and not allow anger or, or it's unfair or whatever to warp what is a very personal and intimate experience mm. in that process. Mm. So thank you for sharing this with us, but it also gave me a time to kind of reflect again. Well, thank and you, Lisa. And, and Jeff was, was a wonderful friend and miss him up here on stage singing with us and playing. Um, Thanks for your courage and your work with them. And Renee, let me thank you for helping today with the service. I want to make sure I acknowledge all the hard work that all the people... I'll do better next time. Sundays. <laughs> you did great. Yeah, yeah. Close enough, right? That's what we say. Yeah, and a shout out to the, the, the Sound and Lights crew over there. Thank you very much. Did you want to? One of, yeah, sure. One of the one of the th themes that emerged that I didn't talk about is death, and one's um, proper comportment towards death. How how do you relate? How do you uh, face death? And Dylan Thomas has a pretty clear recommendation. Uh, and the question is, well, what's the alternative? Uh, how how does one approach? What is it? Uh, the, the great question is, is it the end, the end, or is there something after? I know that you and, and Jeff talked about that, and um, it, it matters how you conceive of that, how you might resist it in a nonviolent way. Uh, it may reduce the likelihood of anger if you know that you're going to live forever in a different form, but it, it might also um, augment the tragedy that you have to leave the people you're with now and here. Um, it's not clear. Hi, Joe. Hi, Mark. That, you're an amazing man. I mean, I, I, I know we all know that. But I, mean, I, but I didn't know about the trauma that you've been through, you know, the type of assault and things like that and, that have occurred. And, and to be where you are today, to, to come to the point, I mean, PhD, philosophy, I mean, to be such a, a thinker, can you point to any particular practice that that was so helpful to you in being able to <laughs> overcome that trauma you know to, to to continue to succeed to to continue to yeah. <laughs> i blame my wife no <laughs> oh there's something deeply there's something right about that. Um, I mean, on the one hand, thanks, Joe, for saying that uh, I paid you for that, but um, <laughs> I pr appreciate you saying it anyway. Um, yeah, no, I appreciate that. That's really kind of you to say. And I certainly don't, I don't think of myself as amazing. I just hope to be some, somehow helpful. And um, when I think about how I may have gotten through the trauma and how I might have made it to where I am, um, I mean, it's most accurate to say that the people who loved me helped me and carried me 
through those difficulties. And, and Alix has been with me in the troubles that we've faced together, have forged our relationship in ways that perhaps we wouldn't have chosen, but in ways that have made us stronger. Um, my mother, a uh, single mother, um, left when I was seven with my brother, who was two. Uh, and her constant vigilant work to help me succeed and avoid the worst that could have happened when I was, I was a rebel when I was a kid. Tough kid to be with, I think. Um, don't envy my mother at that job. But she loved me and my grandparents um, who brought me the message of love most clearly and, and taught me the practice of prayer and taught me the value of meditation and gave me a religious framework, which I left for quite a bit of time but gave me a religious framework within which to understand what I should do in spite of the traumas. Um, they were the people who helped me get through. Um, and I, and I, I do believe in love and I do believe in a cosmic dimension of love. I do believe that God is love and being with God that way has helped me. So, I think there's something absolutely right, Mary Ellen, about the idea that the people, the love that I've received have helped me through that and have taught me how to love myself, which was not easy. I was very angry with myself, very disappointed with myself and um, coming to terms with that. Um, I'm glad I'm alive today. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and that wasn't always true. Yeah. Suzanne? Uh, yeah, I'm going to go to the UU Seminary uh, in Chicago, the Meadville Lombard School. And I'm grateful that they've accepted me. Uh, and I'll begin in the fall. Uh, and I don't, I don't know how that'll all shape up. You know, it depends in part on finances and other things going on. Um, but I'm, I'm excited to begin. Uh, the Lotus Sutra and the Chautauqua courses are offered this summer. I'm almost we're ready to just slap down the cash and take those courses. Uh, a summer meditation on the Lotus Sutra would be amazing. Um, but uh, the hope is that I'll be ordained in the UU tradition and that uh, I'll find my way to some community or other, uh, some place or other where I'm able to be me and be loving and to be helpful. That, that's, that's the aim. Uh, the calling has been emerging for five or six years very, very clearly. When I was out in the desert for two years doing the work as dean there, I, it really became clear. I was working in a local black church and I was beginning to realize, you know, I, I, I think this is what I need to be doing now instead of lecturing on Plato and Aristotle and Kant and Wittgenstein. And I, I love doing that and maybe I'll do that part time, but it's not my calling anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't recommend that. <laughs> oh, amen. Yeah. Hey, Jenny. Do you want to say something, Jenny? I do. <laughs> Always. Um, <laughs> I actually first want to say I was sitting over there and listening and thank you it was wonderful I found it really exciting that's kind of my sort of sermon but I felt this huge welling up emotional welling up of love for everybody in this room uh -huh. and so I, I, I my philosophy is if I feel that I should say it out loud to to whoever at that time and so I want to say that to everybody here how much I love everybody in this oh, room, yeah. and that also part of that is extends in a circle out and out and out into infinity. And that I was thinking about it, and I, I mean, in my my path, I call it unity. But I think that's the same as Tao, and and union with with a source of love and every every living thing and all the universes and this universe and everything and everyone in it 
I think that's maybe what the Tao is and what we would call God or equals God equals love. And, um, and the goal of the path is to be in union with that. And there is resistance to that, that idea and to that even getting there because first of all we do have to love ourselves and there's a huge amount of resistance to loving ourselves. We don't think we're worthy. We don't think we're good enough or whatever reason that is. And that's the, f the resistance we need to come over because without that, we can't feel in union with everything. So, uh, you know, I, I got a lot out of that, that I, uh, things that I didn't know and uh, just an expansion of the path I'm on. So, thank you. You remember Belle? Does everybody remember, how many people here remember Belle? She'd stand up with her gloves on and her walker and she'd say, you people are miraculous. I love you people. And I tell you, whenever she said that, it just was such a beautiful, beautiful thought. To, and she meant it 100%. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that echo into the room, Jenny. Uh, any other questions? Um, Grace. And there's something about yeah. grace that holds everything in some kind of wonderful, I don't want to say balance, but relationship to each other. And it's, you know, it just, it's grace. It's a, it's a presence. It's a whatever. And I just yeah. felt, I felt that very much along. Every time someone says love to me lately, I feel grace. Yeah. Including at the times when we had all that crap that was happening this week, I just heard the word grace. Yeah. Hold it in grace. Yeah. Plato thought that beauty was the way that the good manifested itself to perception. Right? And so you sort of modulate that through Neoplatonism into Christianity. And, and grace is the beauty of love, revealing itself. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And, and, you know, we're, we, we can see the day as a beautiful day if we open our eyes to it, mm -hmm. uh, in, spite of, in spite of the flaws and evil. Yeah. Thank you for that, Margo. Yeah. Grace. Love you all. Have a wonderful day. Love you too. Love you too.